Now, on we go to talk about politics and memory. In a way, this, the thought of this is where this, the, the, the idea for this conference was born. Um, as a journalist uh, living in, in Britain, living and working in Britain, what I noticed was the degree to which uh, in the foreground of, of the nation's memory was very much the national catastrophe um, rather than um, the event that shaped uh, 20th century history. And not only that, it is also an emphatically emotional approach, I found, that, uh, that, that prevails here. I mean, if you look at the BBC series on radio and television, um, you know, you, 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 find, you find an idea of the war translated into contemporary dance and opera and, and uh, all sorts of things. The idea is ultimately to engage with the emotions um, of previous generations, uh, it seems to me. It is more about stories than it is about history. And um, that begs the question, um, what to do with Europe, uh, which is the same question Britain faced in 1914 um, as today. So in other words, how can a nation that is deeply involved and wrapped with the, of, with the, with the, in the debate of how do we deal with Europe, do we stay in the European Union or not? How can a nation uh, make that decision when, it's, when it deals with history in that emotive way? Um, and to discuss these questions, I've got with me Maurice Glassman, who was a senior lecturer at, in political theory at London Metropolitan University, uh, where he also ran the Faith Citizenship Program. And um, as a political thinker, Maurice, perhaps more than most, uh, has, has spent a lot of time analyzing the past and relating it to, to the present before uh, coming uh, to an idea about, about the future. Um, with his um, political home in the Labour Party, um, he, he coined the, the phrase of blue labor um, that is based on community values that existed around trade unions um, and, and other voluntary groups in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and um, now coming up with this idea had such an impact on the party leadership that uh, much to his own surprise, I think, uh, he was introduced to the House of Lords a few years ago where he now sits on the Labour benches. And then there is, of course, Donald Sassoon, who I'm particularly happy to introduce here because Donald taught me history 20 years ago. So um, he, is, he, he, he kicked it all off for me. Um, emeritus Professor of, Contemporary, of Comparative European History um, at, at Queen Mary College in London for many decades. Um, during that time, he published widely about fascism, especially in Italy, and about European politics and identity. That's what that's the course I did for you. Um, but he is, of course, particularly known for two uh, amazing tombs, one, the Hundred Years of Socialism and the Culture of the Europeans. Now, I'm quite amazed you're working now on the history of capitalism. That se seems like another uh, 600, 800,000 page work, <laughs> which... Not, not 800,000. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder which publishers uh, actually hand out those contracts. Maybe we can talk about that later. Anyway, Donald, you kick us off now, please. Thank you. Um, by um, trying to go back and look at his states, not nations, but actually states. And in 1914, there were 22 states in Europe, only nine of which were in existence before 1800 and hardly any of these anyway with the same boundaries they had 100 years later. So even those few states which had more than 100 years in 1914 uh, were actually within the same boundaries they were in, 19, in 1914. In the course of the 19th century and in the years leading to the, uh, uh, to the war, two of these states, which did not exist in 1800, but existed in 1914, were formed by forced unification. Um, that is, Germany and Italy, uh, a number of smaller states were gobbled up 
taken over by uh, um, the more powerful of the states existing within those territories, Prussia in the case of Germany and Piedmont in the case of, of Italy. Then we have five more states which uh, in the course of the 19th century seceded from the Ottoman Empire, beginning with Greece in, in 1830 with some form of intervention by the great powers. Um, then Serbia, Bulgaria, Montenegro recognized by in the Berlin Congress of 1878. So there is a great power uh, legitimization, which is one of the ways in which you got to become a state in the 19th century. You have Romania, um, which is the consequence, one of the consequences of the Crimean War, so in 1859. And then Albania, um, which is one of the consequences of the Balkan Wars. We, we barely talked about the Balkan Wars. Um, we, we, after all, uh, 1912, uh, I remember going to Bucharest uh, for a conference on the centenary of the Balkan Wars, and I told my colleagues, historians, uh, I'm going for the centenary. Um, this was in 2012, and I said, the centenary of what, since they're all thinking in terms of 1914. So, uh, um, so ignorant uh, uh, we all are about uh, the 1912 uh, war. And then there is also the formation of Belgium, which is in 1830, uh, and then Norway, um, which was linked to Sweden, but is separated amicably and peacefully in uh, 19, uh, 1907. So we have 19, 1914, we have these 22 states, only nine of which preceded uh, the Napoleonic Wars. We can now look at the consequences. What happens in uh, Europe after 1914? Well, obviously, we have the end of empires. The end of the Ottoman Empire, um, insofar as Europe is concerned, does not produce new um, states, uh, um, except for Turkey, um, obviously, but it does produce a number of states in, uh, in, uh, um, in the Middle East, uh, and many of the previous speakers have mentioned that to some extent um, a lot of the problems of the Middle East now are due to the way in which the Ottoman Empire disintegrated after the First World War. Then we have the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which produces um, Yugoslavia, Austria, um, Hungary, and uh, Czechoslovakia. And then we have the end of a Tsarist Empire, which uh, produces Finland, which was to be part of the Tsarist Empire, although in a, with a special status, and it produces uh, Poland. It then gives also um, independence temporarily during the interwar period to the three Baltic re republics. We then also have, how could I forget it, with two people from Trinity um, Dublin, um, shortly after the end of the First World War, uh, obviously the formation of Ireland, of a traditional West European states. Britain is the one whose boundary change had been the most recent. Uh, and it could have been even more recent had a certain event occurred um, 10 days ago and had gone differently. Uh, two, two weeks ago, is it, uh, and so on. Now, um, so we have a, a, uh, um, the beginning of an explosion of states uh, in uh, Europe. Um, the consequence of a second world war, in terms of the number of states, is a reduction in the number of states only in one case, namely the incorporation of the Baltic republics into the Soviet Union, into the U USSR. So a return, as it were, to the position of the Tsarist Empire only for what is the Baltic Republics, not obviously Finland and, uh, and uh, um, um, Poland, um, which re remain independent. Then, so First World War causes a number of states. Second World War, if anything, does not produce an increase in the number of states, but the collapse of the last empire, that is the Tsarist empire, which had been preserved and saved um, by the communist empire, that collapses as well. And that really brings about a complete change in the configuration of Europe, because we have 
First of all, the return to independence of the three Baltic republics, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Secondly, we have the creation for the first time in history, Belarus, Ukraine, and Moldova. Then we have even the breakup of Czechoslovakia. And then finally, and then finally, we have the end of Yugoslavia, which on its own gives birth to no fewer to seven states, if you include Kosovo. So the situation now is the following. Um, as you can see, we moved from a continuity of nine states, 1800 to 1900, 22 states by 1914, and we are now into 42 states. Um, and this, because I was not generous enough to include Georgia and Armenia, uh, uh, who regard themselves as part of Europe, well, the case simply is strengthened. You know, if it's not 42, it's 44, and so on. It really does not make that much of a difference. Now, what we can remark here is that as the process of disintegration of Europe has continued and accelerated by the First World War and more by the collapse of communism than the actual Second World War, so the First World War is, in terms of the multiplication of state, more crucial than the Second World War. The collapse of communism gives rise to another 10, 12 states. Um, we, have, we, have, uh, um, uh, we have that in a situation where, at the same time as you have the fragmentation of Europe, you have also the most important integrationist experiment which has occurred anywhere in the world so far something like the European Union, which sometimes is put on the same level as Mercosur in Latin America or various trade agreements here and there. Actually, it doesn't look like anything like that. It is not. I agree with Philip Bobbitt. Um, um, it, it's not at all uh, uh, a state by any stretch of the imagination. But nevertheless, it is also not a non-state, since it has uh, quite a large number of features uh, which are prerogative of state, the most important of which, accepted only by 16 of these, is of course the formation of a single currency. Now the currency would be, in the 19th century certainly you felt, well, you know, the currency is a crux, it's really what that, what that means. So the, the formation of a single currency is an extraordinary step, particularly when it is not backed but what are the normal powers of a state which has a single currency, that is fiscal powers. So what is missing enormously, and we're all living with the consequences of, uh, you know, of that, is that uh, this, uh, uh, um, uh, this, uh, the, the European Union, and even the smaller European Union, that is that which has a single currency, actually does not possess uh, the normal instrument of a sovereign state which has a currency, namely it has no tax raising Power. I mean, it's got very minimal tax raising power. I don't want to quibble on the importance of the AT and so on. But you know, in fact, there is no tax, and therefore there is no similar spending power. And so, because welfare and defence are excluded from all the agreements made so far, so it's a it's a sort of weird thing. Here we have 28 states. They are joined together. They have free movement of capital. So far. Mr. Cameron notwithstanding, free movement, or UKIP I should say, if one can tell the difference, um, between uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the free movement of capital, the free movement of labor, but otherwise uh, uh, fiscal powers, welfare spending, defense spending, a foreign policy, are still the preserve of these nation, nation states. Outside, you have a whole list of countries. Um, while the project of the European Union is in, uh, to put it mildly, there is a problem there. Um, some countries are not only are not too happy with it, but the fastest growing political parties in Europe uh, are anti-European. I'm not only thinking, uh, of course, of uh, UKIP here, uh, but there is the Lega Nord in Italy. There is Marine Le Pen, who could be the next president of France, um, also is in two minds at the very least about the European Union. Nevertheless, for a project which has been said to be a failure, what is extraordinary is that a lot of the countries which are outside actually want to get in. Um, the, uh, this is a bizarre kind of club where the people who are in the club say, God, you know, it can't get any worse. The people who are outside the club, some of them at least, say, please, can we be allowed in? And this is 
you know, nearly all the states of the former Yugoslavia. This is, of course, Turkey, half of Ukraine, and could be, could be even, uh, even, uh, even, uh, even more. So um, the, the uh, peculiarity of the European situation then is a two-pronged movement, the one towards fragmentation, the one towards greater unity. Many of these states are allegedly ethnically based insofar as that they are part of a narrative in which they re reinvent their own traditions almost uh, constantly, and they try to trace back their true ethnicity to 100 years, 1,000 years. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed, amused by the recurrence of 66, 1066 in the British case, but, uh, or in the English case, uh, but in the Polish case, it's one extra 100 years, it's nine, 966, to which both communists and anti-communists agreed with. So that, that is the situation in Europe. If we are to cast our, as we've been encouraged quite rightly, by people um, outside Europe. And we look, say, at the new continent, that is, at the Americas, a continent in which uh, statehood is not, cannot be, for obvious reasons, be, be based really on ethnicity, since in nearly all cases, I think in all cases, in fact, uh, the dominant group or only, the only group uh, are settlers from outside. Uh, we find the extraordinary consistencies and continuities of the boundaries of the new continent. Um, if you take Latin America, most of the, most of the countries of Latin America became in, independent in uh, 1810, and very few wars in Latin America, very few interstate wars, plenty of coup d'etats and stuff, but if you want to actually look at interstate conflicts, in Latin America, there are hardly any. They go on about the Pacific War, Bolivia, Chile, and so on, and they looked up at the great battle, you know, 3,000 dead, which is like five minutes in the Somme, you know. So when it comes to bloodshed, no one beats the European. When one uh, is thinking in terms of uh, boundaries between states, they are far more respected, where ethnicity does not really count for much, because even though there is a constructed Argentinian nationalism, Uruguayan nationalism, and I mean, everybody in Latin America hates the Argentinians and, and so on and so forth. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it never, never reaches uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, anything similar to the heights even of 19th century Europe, let alone 20th century Europe. And if we look at the North American part, boundaries are also extremely stable there with one major and very important secessionist attempt the Civil War, the, the, the South, and so on. And once that was defeated uh, in a bloodbath, but nevertheless, once that was defeated, actually the boundaries of the United States have remained extremely stable. I'm told there is a Texan independent party, but frankly, you know, it, it doesn't seem to worry anyone um, very, very much. Uh, in fact, Canada would represent the only instance in which there is a potential secessionist movement there in terms of the Quebecois. If we then look to Africa, uh, now that continent was entirely carved up uh, by the colonial uh, powers, especially if you think of sub-Saharan Africa, since there is some reason to claim continuity for Egypt uh, and Morocco. But nevertheless, for so the whole of South Saharan Africa, this is all decided by colonialists uh, who um, constructed states uh, dividing uh, ethnic groups uh, somewhere as big, I mean, think of the Maasai or, or the Yoruba, 20, 30 million, I mean, much bigger than most ethnic groups in uh, Europe. Uh, and in spite of uh, the constant uh, uh, horrors uh, of wars in, in Africa, most of the problems are civil wars rather than interstate wars. There are relatively few interstate wars, and also there are relatively few secessionist movements. I mean, South Sudan and Eritrea are the two examples of new African, I mean, post-colonial new African states. Th these, are, these are pretty, pretty rare. And if we then cast our eyes towards uh, the Asian continent, well, um, frontiers are actually relatively stable even, even there. Uh, China, um, Japan, obviously. India, as it exists now, has never existed before, but then uh, even before, you did not have a greater India anyway. Um, so the, uh, the, what, what we now call India uh, is the result of, yes, ethnic conflicts and 
the, uh, uh, you know, the rise of Pakistan and so on. I mean, there is a, a very important, major, massive uh, ethnic element in that. But nevertheless, uh, uh, the borders of what the old India thing have remained the borders of old um, British India, but divided into, uh, depending if you call Burma in it or not, but anyway, four or uh, states or, or so. So one would say, and I just want to conclude because I was told to be synthetic, um, <laughs> is uh, that uh, the, the history of Europe is peculiar. No one else has done uh, anything like that. No one else has exhibited the extraordinary proliferation of states in such a recent past. Each of these states think they've been around for a thousand years, but actually they've been around for very, very little. And also, this is not a continent which has ever been ruled by a single power, not by a single man, not by a single power. Julius Caesar didn't manage it, Charlemagne didn't manage it, Napoleon didn't manage it, and you know, it has been totally un unruly. And so in these circumstances, what I would have liked, but as a historian, I know only too well that it's pie in the sky, what are the, I would have liked to see in the constant discussion about the iniquities from Brussels and all the problems uh, which we have uh, to put in perspective um, this history, the one of this multiplication of state, and also, however, the history of this experiment, uh, which is the one experiment, uh, totally new, which tries, perhaps, in a reasonable sort of way, to put some order in uh, European affairs, uh, a continent where reasonableness has never, never, but never been uh, to, at the order of the day. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, uh, thank you, and thank you to the LSE for the invitation. Um, we did a I did a panel 20 years ago with Craig Calhoun at the American Sociological Association on, on Karl Polanyi, and uh, I just want to say how much I respect um, your work and also how much that idea of a radical tradition has, uh, has enriched a whole area of debate. I also noticed with with some alarm that there's a, um, there's a picture of Anthony Giddens with three left hands on the wall over, over here. I, I don't know if that's a reference to the third way, but my dad always used to say um, that always get a one-armed lawyer, so he couldn't say on the one hand this and, and on the other hand that, and, and that's um, quite a scary prospect. I also want to make an apology, which is that it's, uh, I know that the, the weight of dead Jews has in a way hung on the conversation today, but this evening is Yom Kippur, so I'm going to have to, in the first paradox, it's a fast day, but I'm going to have to get home to eat. So um, forgive me for leaving so soon um, after, the, after the talk. Um, in a way, what I want to do here is, is, is um, the opposite of what Donald did, um, in as much as what I want to look at is particularly answer um, the question posed about forever at war with Europe, and to try and retrieve um, a very important notion that has sort of gone quiet, fallen into uh, disrepair, but will be enormously important in the decade ahead, which is the English political tradition, and, and particularly outline why it is um, that the, you know, what you write, rational arguments for or against continued membership of the EU have failed to make a real impact and then the almost despairing question, politics needs memory, but at what point is history getting in the way of sensible political discussion? And to say that this is already to assume a, an administrative rationalism that is, that is actually quite hostile to politics and, and definitely hostile to, to a fundamental understanding of, of what's, going, what's going on. So what I'll do is, is, is just outline, and I think that with what's happened in Scotland, this is going to come into central focus. I think that if there is a European referendum, we will all have to confront this thing of England. Um, not least because Scotland historically used to go into alliance with France and used to go into alliance with European powers um, against England, and that there will be a very different national approach um, to, to the question of 
um, membership of the EU and the identity of the European Union. So just, just to begin, therefore, the talk is, is that just to say that, that there is a constitution in England, and it's called the ancient constitution, and it still prevails. And, and it's utterly at odds with the codification of European written constitutions. And it's based on the balance of interests rather than the separation of the powers or the separation of interests. And the fundamental um, institutions that work within the ancient constitution are parliament. And within parliament you have a locational democracy in terms of the commons where people elect people from particular areas. Uh, and then you have this very strange institution that I've wandered into, which is the House of Lords, um, where historically it's been a vocational chamber, where the church is represented, where the law is represented, where um, universities were represented. Um, so you have parliament, you have the monarchy, which is um, hugely important. And I just want to flag up a concept that I think will come more and more into play, um, which, is, which applies to Australia and, and Canada. Um, which is of the federal monarchy. And I think that this will be much more of an interesting concept working in England as we think about how to decentralise power and how to reconstitute solidarity uh, and, and a centre. So that there's parliament, there's the monarchy, then there's the church, um, which is a very significant part. Um, that was true of the English church generally before the Reformation, which I'll get to, and then the representation of the Church of England um, there. And then the fourth aspect of the ancient constitution is the City of London, which is a corporation, a very ancient corporation, the oldest continuous democratic commune in, in all of Europe, um, established in 1191 as a commune and uninterrupted from that point. Uh, the problem that we confront, which is not incidental to the story, is that as opposed to representing the ancient liberties and democracy, it represents entirely the interests of capital. So that's a, that's a very important part of the a very important part of the story. But in this in this idea, the the monarchy represented the head and the family. Um, Parliament represented um, the land and the vocations and the interests. The church represented the soul, and the city represented both urban self-government but also the interests of business and the idea within the English tradition is that political matters would be sorted out between them, that they would hold each other accountable um, within the, the, the polity that was England. And here comes um, the point, so the really crucial you know, first event, John, which is forever at war with Europe, is the Norman Conquest. Um, and what's very important about the Norman Conquest is it was perceived in the English imagination for centuries as an attempt to impose absolutist rule on a free people. That that was uncontested within the um, tradition generally, that it was an attempt to impose statute law and an attempt to impose um, foreign rule and traditions that were alien to the English tradition. And what's vital for our understanding is that that assumed that there pre-existed the Norman Conquest, these, these ancient constitution where things were in balance. So the Norman Conquest, when 98% of the freehold of the country was transferred to the conqueror um, and his barons, there was one exception, and that exception was the city of London. The, um, William the Conqueror came friendly to London London had its own militia, um, law courts were still allowed in English, there was still allowed use of common law. And, and, and so the, the city of London became the centre of the resistance to this, uh, a centuries long resistance to this European foreign domination. And, and that manifested itself in, in many forms, the very important concepts are that there was a common language, which was English, which was extremely important. What Professor Calhoun said today, when it comes to nations, it's, it's not that constructed traditions are immaterial. They are embodied in institutions and reproduced through generations, not only in the formal law, in the legal order, but in the folklore and in the, uh, and in the, and in the oral law. The idea of the common law was very distinctive, which is based not on statute and parliamentary procedure, but based on precedent the rule of thumb, that the common law. And then there was the idea of the commons, the commons itself, the house of commons, the common lands. So there was a very strong idea 
of resistance to a European conception of um, arbitrary rule um, that, that manifests itself in the Norman Conquest. Um, and then there's, there's many skirmishes with, um, as you know, with France, but then the next hugely important moment in the formation of the ancient constitution and the English polity is the Armada and the attempt to impose Catholic absolutism associated with the Inquisition, with the Holy Roman Empire um, on Britain. Once again, th this is absolutely relevant to the previous conversation, huge fears about the Catholic alliances with Ireland um, and also considerations relating to to, to Scotland, and that was another very important moment in the assertion of the very paradoxical nature of the English tradition, which is simultaneously liberty and democracy, that there are certain things, a uh, commitment to, to liberty um, of conscience, which was particularly carried within the city. But in all these conflicts with, with um, France, stemming from the, from the conquest, and then the battle with Spain, something else very important is going on is that England is developing a maritime trade, not a landed trade, and a conception of empire that's not based on the administration of territory, but on the control of the water, on the control of the sea routes. And that's where it's very important to, I think, grasp that the establishment of the Hudson Bay Company through the City of London with New York, the establishment of Wall Street, goes on before 1603, before the union of the crowns with Scotland, and certainly before 1707 with the union of the parliaments. So there is a distinctively English tradition that's based on resistance to what was referred to as tyranny, as continental absolutism, as the rule of foreigners, as a direction um, of the country, a distinctiveness of the political tradition um, within the country, that then actually built an, an, uh, an international network, an imperial network, only to talk about the paradoxical nature, only England could consider even a concept of free trade imperialism, yeah, that, that it wasn't based on territorial administration in that way, but of, which we see now with a huge legacy of Hong Kong, mm. Hong Kong, think England in relation to Europe, of Hong Kong in relation to China, if you want to get a grasp of um, the difference in the traditions, the notion of being an island, it makes complete sense that the sea provides a barrier and a, and a difference. And so therefore this, this combination of common law, a maritime empire, a balanced constitution, and then this very strange combination that characterizes the English tradition of um, traditionalism at home, traditionalism in terms of monarchy, in terms of um, the renewal of inherited forms of democratic representation and of completely transformative capitalist spirit of international trade. That those are the, are the things that's going on. Um, and the word, you know, if you talk about common language, common law, commons, that the dominant concept which was used was the commonwealth. Now here it's very important to grasp that all of this goes on um, within the Tudor, with the emergence of the Stuarts, who are Scottish kings coming, coming down with the union of the crowns um, in 1603, is, is that they try to rule without Parliament, and they try to rule through statute law and outside, um, outside of the common law tradition, and also try to impose in various ways religious conformity in, in a country um, that was used to quite a degree of diversity within that. And, it, and it's important to note that the, um, that the English uh, um, cut the king's head off. You know, there, there was a straightforward um, secession uh, um, of that. So the Atlantic trade was enormously important to this development of, of Englishness. So, the, so it's to grasp the paradox, this was not a little Englandism. This was the development of an international maritime empire of which London was the hub. It was also the development of an international legal order where again London um, was the hub. There was the development of an international university system in which um, Britain, and this is enormously important in terms of the development of 
the United States, because if you look at the ideology, for example, of the City of London based on these three things, federalism, that the, that the Crown could not subordinate the city to its rule. And they, you know, the outbreak of the English Civil War, if you remember, is when the King tried to arrest Cromwell and Pym in the City of London, entered armed, which he was not allowed to do, and that was the trigger for the Civil War. But if you look at America in terms of federalism, in terms of free trade, in terms of freedom of religion, what you can see here is a network of, of an international, international system that is absolutely based on a resistance to tyranny, on a resistance to the territorial military enforcement, the key institutions domestically within the development of the English state and then the British state um, are the navy and the treasury. It's not the army, and, and, it, and it, I would argue that it took until 1948 for there to be internal colonization with the return and then the administration of people through, through a particular conception um, of a welfare regime. So, um, so in that framework, John, what I'm saying to you is understand the EU in terms of a, not just the First World War, but in terms of a longer history in involving centralizing militaristic um, Euro European um, powers, which the whole identity of England and then Britain was forged to oppose. Then we come to the, to the First World War and the particularities of the First World War. Now, what happens here, I think, is you've got um, two very big changes. It's the first time that there's an elevation of the army over the navy in terms of the British, uh, the British state. And this is also the first time that there's a genuine engagement in what the intricacies that they used to call it, that was the phrase the British dipl diplomats used, the intricacies of European politics. That, that, that this was a time that there had to be, and here, there was a very strong moment, obviously, with 1789, with the French Revolution, where English, England also depicted that as another terror, another despotism, another attempt at militaristic uniformity, which was to be resisted by the, by the diversity and the traditionalism um, of, the, of the English tradition now manifest itself through the British state. And, um, and then the emergence of Germany is certainly consistent with that, that Germany was a militaristic power, a centralizing power, an authoritarian power, and that it wished to militarily destroy liberty and it wished to um, undermine the, net, the British supremacy within the, the maritime economy. And that's how, uh, and so this war is a very different war and a very significantly different war in as much as, first of all, you have the first time of the mass sacrifice of soldiers, the proletarianization of Britain, the follow-up of the enclosures that were pushed through in the, really pushed through after the 1830s, the abolition of the apprenticeship laws, this landless mass of people. And so what you have is the army becomes an employer as well of an enormous mass of displaced people and you have a very different, I think, after 1914, you have a very different expression of the British imperial state that is far more concerned with territory, far more concerned with territorial administration. For example, the BBC that you mentioned was founded in 1922 directly as an attempt to depict a national story. Um, of what Britain was, but you also see it in what was mentioned in earlier discussions in the Sykes-Picot map. Historically, it would have been the case within British foreign policy tradition that you wouldn't have gone for multinational nation states. You would have, the T, if you compare the T. Lawrence map to the Sykes-Picot map, you see the eclipse mm. of a much more flexible idea of local and natural allegiance to religion, clan, ethnicity, um, and, and that transformed into a much stronger nation-state position. I've already seen that I've uh, spoken for too long. So to conclude, what's vital is to understand that what has happened in the last few months with the Scottish referendum 
is the re-emergence of England that had been rather smothered by Britain. That England was in 1603 and it was in 1707 and it still is today ten times the size of Scotland. You could fit, just so, to give, so that we get the perspective of this right, you could fit all of Scotland into North London and you could fit all of Wales into South London and that's not included council houses, that's just private um, mortgaged properties. Um, that the scale of England is enormous, so the nature of the union was by its nature in that sense generous in terms of representation and, and transfers and various other other conventions, but that's, but that's altered now, and there, there's an understanding um, that, that, uh, that, that the assertion of the interests of the Scottish Parliament in relation to the British Parliament, if you ask the English, if you ask English people where's their Parliament, I, I was privy to a really mad discussion recently where they said, well, why don't we set up an English Parliament in Manchester? And for English people on the whole, they understand that their parliament is where it is, <laughs> in Westminster, and that the Scots joined that parliament, um, that it's not to be moved elsewhere. So what, what you will see is a, is a simultaneous assertion of an internationalism that we can earn our living in the world through the reactivation of global trading networks, a resistance to homogenisation and uniformity, which is, it, which is perceived to be... Um, the consequence of the EU and a very strong feeling for democratic self-government within the traditions that have been inherited and, and a renewal of that. So just to say this is not emotional, this is not visceral, this is the tradition within which people have worked for, for many hundreds of years. It's not isolationist in as much as it's much more open to the world um, than such a description would suggest but it's also to suggest to everybody that you cannot think of modernity without also thinking about tradition. And the challenge ahead is to fashion a conception of that tradition that is more generous than that we have at the moment. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a lot of food for thought there. Comments, questions? That gentleman in the suit there, yes, who's waving with the black hair. I, I can't see your face. Yes, you. Names. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is William Wong. I, I just wanted to explore a little bit about contemporary artistic depictions of the 1914-18 to 18 conflict. I think earlier it was one gentleman saying, are we in danger of looking at the whole thing in an overly Eurocentric way? I, I would actually argue it's not even Eurocentric. It's probably very Anglo-American-centric. Um, I was humbled last night, I was just talking to a, a friend of mine, and she said, oh, uh, her elder daughter's birthday is coming up. So I said, oh, when's that? 11th of November. I mean, just, ah, I'm it is day. It's obvious, isn't it? She said, no, it's Independence Day. So Independence from what? Well, Poland. And then it dawned on me, ah, okay. The same day has multiple references. That's the first point. Um, going back to the art thing, I'm not talking about wartime posters and <coughs> propaganda. If you go to the Tower of London now, if anybody you have been there, you will see the tower spilling our blood. Over 880,000 ceramic poppies are being planted as we speak here, and it will finish on 11th of November. Um, I love art. I think it's amazingly powerful. I'm also thinking about The War Horse, the very, very successful book by uh, Michael Mapugo, uh, adapted to the stage by National Theatre and transferred to New York for that. My question really is, as powerful and popular as they may be, is there a real risk of making the whole thing simplistic? I was thinking if I was a six-year-old boy and asking, hey, Daddy, you know, what's all these? Why, why are there so many red flowers? What would you say? And you say, oh, because if they fought, these people died. And I would be asking, well, why did they die? You know, the questions go on. I think you know what I'm getting at. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Leo, <laughs> of course. <laughs> A staple of the discussion. Uh, I haven't, right, yeah. Um, empire Leo. means nothing to the people. This word has no real Sorry. tangible. Uh, the word empire has no meaning to the people. It has no tangible, everyday understanding. But people go to the church 
regularly. People go to religious schools. Most of our leaders come from religious schools. People go to church on Sunday. And uh, people call themselves Christian, Jewish, and Muslims. They understand religion and church. So why don't we use the word church instead of empire? Because people then can feel part of that process and then have a sense of responsibility and guilty of maybe terrible genocides. So do you think that we have a duty to use language that people can relate to? That's my question. Okay. This one, in the far back. Right at the back? Yeah. Yes, right at the back. Hello, my name is David Collins. Um, my question is, what effect do the war dead, the war wounded, and the grieving relatives have on the, the future? Because uh, ten, whilst we have monuments to the dead, rightly, they, in a way, stop change taking in the future because we cannot change what they fought to preserve. Um, one little example might be the Falkland Islands, where it now becomes impossible to negotiate with Argentina about its future because we had 250 of our dead die and with Argentina, impossible to move anything from a full claim on the islands because they lost even more people. What, what is your opinion on the effect of war, dead and wounded on the future? Okay, who would like to go first? Donald? We have um. art, church and empire, and the war dead. Yeah, that can make it sound really cool, man. Um, to to a large extent, we have to use, or we do use, a language which, is, which can be understood because there is something, you know, we share something in common. So whilst there is a religious element in, uh, uh, underneath the idea of empire, um, and especially in the 19th century, the kind of justification which were used to build the empire had often a religious uh, undertone. The French would speak of the mission civilisatrice and, and you know, the white man burden and all that sort of thing. Because it was by then, given the semi-democratic nature of European politics, it was a little bit tricky to say, we're going to fight a war in order to stop Russia from going in there, or we're going to fight a war because some of our people make money out of this particular piece of territory. So the idea, what I was mentioning earlier this morning, that you need to have popular justifications. Um, but however, these popular justifications are not, are, are what they are. I mean, the task of a historian is to deconstruct this popular justification and examine why they're there. Why do they arise in this particular moment in time? Why do they work to the extent that they work at all? Um, and in a sense, we are not in the business of either celebrating them or knocking them down. We are in the business, or at least historians, I hope, are in the business of trying to explain why they are, they are, they are, they are, they are there. I should say personally, if I can have a little uh, autobiographical thing, my enormous suspicion of um, national narrative arose rather early because purely out of an accident of birth, I started going to school in France, in uh, Paris, and when I was six or seven, we had a big book which has maths, which had all sorts of things, and one of the things which it had, um, I'm old, so they still had the term, nos ancêtres les Gaulois, our ancestors, uh, you know, the Gaul, and although my ancestors are Middle Eastern Jews, you know, and the Gaul has nothing to do with it, I recited along all that, and then there was a picture of Vercingetorix, um, in, the, in the book, uh, which had been captured uh, by the detestable and detested Romans and taken to Rome. And by the time I was eight, the uh, family vicissitude were such that I was, we went to Italy and I went into an, an Italian school. And in this Italian school, the maths was the same and you know, geography was more or less the same, but uh, the history bit was quite different. In fact, Vercingetorix did not appear at all. And when I asked the, my uh, the teacher, and I said, but you know, what about Vercingetorix? She looked at me in complete bewilderment. Then something clicked, and she says, ah, Vercingetorix, yes, one of the many barbarians wiped out by the might of Roman legions, and so on. So you know, if that could occur in terms of the national narratives in schools. Now, if you went to a French school in the 18th century, there was no goal. 
Um, gold is a 19th century invention, and I suspect quite a lot of uh, the kind of standard narrative of British history, English history, French history, the story of freedoms or not freedoms, um, quite a bit are added up and constructed in the course of the year. They're not completely invented. There's got to be something, you know, which is empirically verifiable there. So, you know, it's, it would be extremely complicated, I suppose, for uh, um, someone to, you know, discuss uh, the, uh, you know, uh, tolerance uh, in, uh, in, uh, in um, Spain under the Holy Inquisition. You know, it would be quite a feat. But nevertheless, um, a lot of it uh, is uh, an attempt to piece together various bits of history and to write a coherent thing. So when I don't disagree with Morris on, on, the, on the main thing about the, you know, the importance of freedoms and so on in, in Britain, but you go to Holland and they have a similar narrative about the importance of tolerance in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, you, you even go to France in which the uh, revocation of the Edict de Nantes, which guaranteed religious uh, t tolerance, the revocation by Louis XIV, is seen as one of the big mistakes of the reign of Louis XIV because before uh, one could, uh, there could be two religions in France as long as you are patriotic and, and, and so on and so forth. And in terms of the longevity of some of the corporations, but, you know, medieval city, cities in Italy also exhibited some of these, of these features. In, in other words, you know, a lot of that stuff travels around and are imitated and are imported and are copied. And you, know, you do not have a singular uh, yeah. moment. And in terms of the First World War, and I can now say my bit, having had to endure reading it in the newspapers, that, that somehow um, you know, has been completely reinvented as a war against uh, uh, German totalitarianism, which is you know, the First World War, which is absolutely extraordinary. There was universal suffrage, universal manhood suffrage in Germany in 1914, and there wasn't universal manhood suffrage uh, before that uh, in, uh, in uh, Britain, and you know, as well as institutions such as the, uh, the House of Lords. The Socialist Party was the first party in, uh, in pre-First World War Germany. And in France, you had, of course, also universal manhood suffrage. In, in other words, these are things that happen more or less at the same time in a variety of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, um, um, states. And of course, if we want to make a narrative simple, then we make it simple. But I think the job of academics, the job of historians, is to say, and I know why we are so hated and it's so boring, because we come along and say, well, actually, it's not that simple. And not, not just historians, I think. This is, no, no, this is also... I'm not taking... No, no, also, also, uh, also politicians, I think. Um, just to immediately respond to that, um, so one of the distinctive things about the English tradition is its synthetic nature. That's, I think, extremely Im important part of it, and that it's a, a civic and not an ethnic category, that it involves linguistic, legal, and institutional forms, all, all built around this idea of the balance of interests. That's the really crucial thing, is the, is the, balance, the balance of interests, uh, and uh, the act of, of retrieving that is how we, so essentially it's how we liberate the concept of the EU from um, neoliberal economists and public administrators. And one of the crucial changes is the nature of, of this federal republic that emerged in Germany after the war. Um, a huge amount of my life is spent, you know, extolling the virtues of the federal republic in terms of co-determination, work representation on boards, in terms of federalism, in terms of regional banks, and above all, in terms of a vocational system, the handwork, which is another very interesting way which, in which a very old tradition was modernised. Um, and so it's to put together a, a, a synthetic history that can make, can make sense of things. In terms of the questions that were asked, you know, when my children ask me about the poppy, I always say, well, the poppy was the first time that Britain found something that it could sell to China in, in, ter in terms of the heroin trade, in terms of the opium trade. Um, so that, that's just, um, it's a very interesting symbol of war, um, the poppy, and um, something that maybe on another platform I would explore more um, elegantly. But, but that's, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting one that that is the symbol um, in terms of what Neil said, it's absolutely vital that, um, that academics too use language that people can understand. 
and 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 relate to. I, I, it's not it's not the case that empire. I think is 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 a, uh, one of one of the dead words. But one of the interesting things that's going on now in terms of England. This is the first time since the Reformation that um, the Catholic tradition has been in the mainstream of English politics. There's a huge interest in Catholic social thought. Uh, this relates actually to Christian democracy and the emergence of Germany because also within Catholic social thought there's the idea that you don't have the sovereignty of capital, that you have to have a representation of workers as well as the representation of business. Um, it also within Catholic social thought, which has really worked in terms of the policy review that I've been working on, is subsidiarity, um, which, w which wasn't a very developed Anglican concept at all, i.e. decentralisation of power uh, and, and federalism. So I think the important thing is, 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 if you, is, is that the church is not an uncomplicated concept, and I think that this is an example of the generosity of the English tradition, is that now... Uh, a very, if you look at the Elizabethan settlement, it was Protestant and violently anti-Catholic in form. That was part of the opposition to the Holy Roman Empire. Um, that's completely changed and completely transformed. And one of the extraordinary things about the Scottish referendum in a country that was really, until very recently, divided between Calvinist, Protestant and, and Catholic was how little um, that played out. Um, and then in terms, of, in terms of David, I mean, this is, this is of direct political importance. So UKIP are arguing, and it's a very powerful argument, that war veterans should be given welfare priority, that they shouldn't have to wait, they should be given a greater degree of NHS priority, housing priority, um, because they've made a sacrifice, and that's a form of contribution that hasn't been recognised in the existing system. So it's just to open up that the whole concept, the army is in a very liberal contractual society, the covenantal nature of the soldier, someone who is prepared to die, is, is quite anomalous to the general thing and still has, so that's one of the things, coming out of the First World War, the two dominant institutions were the monarchy and the army. And that hadn't been the case, certainly in the case of the army um, before. And the, and the way that we conceptualise how we honour veterans, how they fit in, because there's huge issues of depression, mental illness, um, inability to adjust. And within a homogenous welfare system where everybody is treated equally, they're not, there's a feeling that they're not being honoured and they're not being treated correctly. So just to say, it's not just about the Falklands, it's going to be next year a direct political issue and it behoves all of us to think about conceptually how we respond to that. Okay. Third row here. I might be guilty of making narratives simple. I might. Those of you who watched the film will remember that Lotta Hat Blauer Algen, Blau Algig, she um, was taken by illusions. It's more or less the same as wearing rose tinted spectacles. So, Lotta Bar Blau Algig in the film. Um, I want to try, get, I, I, I'm going to quote Yeats, so I'm going to sail back to Byzantium, which is what I always do under these circumstances. Um, but I do want to think about some kind of world which used to exist, and which existed for a very long time, as I have said repeatedly, and which was, at the one level, very diverse, and had certain commonalities. Now, this term of sharing has come up time and time again in the course of today. People have used shared sort of communities, shared values and something. There was something about this organization, which lasted for a very long time, where you had people from a lot of very different places, of ethnically pretty different, some of them, who spoke at home pretty different languages, but there were certain things which they shared. In that particular case, there was a sort of shared administrative system and there was a sort of shared administrative language. There was also a shared emperor, um, like it or not. So that was one of the things which actually gave these people a sense of commonality. Now, 
I don't know how they did this and how they did this for so long. Some of what um, I'm sort of thinking about is a bit about what Morris was actually talking about when he was talking about this British empire that had diversity but shared sort of certain shared institutions. I don't know whether that Europe, which Donald described, which is in fact sort of terribly fragmented, could be reformed as some kind of, I'm not going to call it an empire, but that is possibly the ambition. And I go right the way back to the discussion that was at the beginning of today, which we actually first started talking about, which is some kind of some kind of system where we share something, where we share certain rights and ideas of rights, and I would certainly subscribe to Richard Sennett's view that some of those rights have to be the kind of rights which he has described. How did they get there? How can we get there? Is something which I think we need to think about. <coughs> Thank you. David. Um, well, I found it very helpful to have this discussion of the English tradition. But the English tradition, we had it in relation primarily to institutions within the UK. Um, one of the things that needs to be looked at is the English tradition, if there is one, in terms of policy towards the European continent. Um, and if you look at that, or at least how it's historically panned out, um, it hasn't been one of unmitigated isolationism. It's not. No. It's actually been one of alternating I think impulses towards, or even conflicting impulses towards isolationism and involvement. Um, it's a tradition going back well before the union with Scotland, tradition back to the 14th century of keeping the Low Countries out of the control of a hostile power. There's been more recently in the 18th, 19th century the whole business of preserving some kind of balance of power in Europe. Yeah. Now, if you move into the modern period, where the First World War fits in, I think, into all of this, is on the one hand you can read it as a tremendous symbol of the dangers of European involvement and the huge loss of life that can happen if Britain tries to behave as a continental country with a large continental army. So the, the conclusion, in some ways, that influenced British governments in the 30s to move towards a position of radical isolationism and appeasement, which turned out to be very dangerous. Yeah? So I think you need to look not just at the impact of the First World War, but the impact of the Second World War, after which very different conclusions were drawn. And even the post-45 Labour government, which didn't get involved in the Schuman Plan and the coal and steel community, it nonetheless got involved in a large number of other European institutions. The view that it took yeah, was that Britain needed to be permanently involved in the European country, uh, uh, politics and economic life because it was essential for British interests to have Europe as a stable entity where new wars and revolutions and political extremism couldn't develop. So I, mean, I think what needs to be looked at now yeah, is, is whether the balance needs to be readjusted in the sense of that the European project itself has changed since 1991, and it may be that, you know, that it's more difficult to reconcile with English traditions of sovereignty. But it shouldn't drive us towards a tradition of iso back towards isolationism, which is, or even trying to sabotage European integration. That, I think, is extremely dangerous. Do you want to yeah. respond straight away? Yeah, um, I, 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 I do, and just to say I agree but that this is an act of imagination that's required. Um, a, a, an act of imagination that I would encourage historians to participate in rather than reject, because just simply having a deconstructive role um, is ultimately nihilistic. There are different ways of framing plausible and reasonable stories, and uh, they can contest with one another. But in terms of what you take, this is absolutely right. So it, it's not a... It is inconceivable to think of England without Europe. This is a madness, for the start. Second, um, and, and that's true of, of communes, if you look at, if you look at Bologna and, and, you, and you look at Rome and you look at London, it's all going on at the same time. Frankfurt, these are simultaneous motions that, that go through. Um, that's not the issue. And you're completely correct in saying that we pursued, we pursued a balance of power approach um, in, in Europe. Um, so we've got to get away from thinking that the choice is between total involvement and isolation. It will never be the case that, that we will be, I, I mean, 
At, it's a it's a Labour Party story, you know, when Attlee was told about the Treaty of Rome, you know, with the six countries, his response was, you know, liberated for lit two. You know, that was the, the general um, response uh, response to that. But nonetheless, the, the there was an extraordinary participation of um, the Labour government in the reconstruction of Germany, and it was particularly in North Rhine-Westphalia. So what America conceptualized, and I think this is a very important story, what America conceptualized was a federal system based on free trade. What Ernest Bevin, as foreign minister, authorized within North Rhine-Westphalia was precisely the industrial relations system, which the Americans completely opposed. This is what I did my PhD on, so I'm very boring on it. If you look through the records, America said, what are you doing allowing workers on boards? What are you doing allowing labor market entry to be guaranteed? And it was, oh, well, you know, that's what they do here, and the unions, we don't want to, the unions to go communist, and the Catholic Church say that it's okay. They smuggled it in. So there's, there's, there's a real w issue now of, of conceptualizing of a federal Europe where there's genuine decentralizations of powers that work within different traditions within that is not hung up on the sovereignty issue alone. Mm -hmm. And it was also the military, um, the continued mi military presence in, in Germany and within NATO. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, but then th this is a moment um, that we could, um, where, we, where we attach another idea to, to 1914 as a, as a date, seeing that we are remembering, this, uh, remembering it this year, which is that um, since then there's been, the English have found a new way of, uh, f of, of formulating their national narrative, because if you, which is based on, on institutions and, 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 and the way they, 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 they relate to the continent, what um, went out of the window, it seems, then in 1914 is the, the cultural links that Britain and England has had with Europe for over a thousand years. I mean, um, the idea that the, the, the Anglo-Saxons came um, in, 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 towards the end of the fifth century. Um, if you look at, if you look at uh, 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 literature, think Beowulf, think Brothers Grimm, and then think um, of Tolkien. There is a straight line in the way stories are told that links England particularly Completely. to the continent in a way that is visceral, yes, but how is it that that's completely ignored since 1914? What do you think? I mean, it's... Well, well, well what, what do I think is I think that one of the paradoxes of post-war Europe is that while well, post-war Germany has been an extraordinary industrial and commercial success, something died artistically. There's been a dearth of the television. I mean, I've spent quite a lot of time in Germany. Art... Uh, m music, pop music, you know, we're looking for links. We're looking mm. for, for, I think I think that's true, and I would say that there's an unprecedented goodwill, so that you know, I'm not, I'm not saying, I, I come across an unprecedented goodwill to Germany as a, as, a, as, a, as a peaceful trading nation, and one with which we have huge ties, but there's also a reluctance of Germans to engage in historical memory because of the fear of what that evokes the damage done that, yeah, well, by, yeah, the, by well, the Nazis yeah. has led to an am amnesia. So between beer-swilling lederhosen and a kind of nihilistic modernism, we're not getting a lot out of you. So up your game. You know, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Well, actually, I mean, <coughs> uh, Morris, you must, you must concede that um, Germany, of all the countries that emerged out of the Second World War, and not immediately, but at least from the 1960s onward, did quite a lot, um, much more than most, uh, to confront the oh. issue of its, of its history, of Nazism and so on. I mean, it is extremely <coughs> difficult to um, fault them on that. I would go, uh, other okay. countries uh, have a problem. I agree. Uh, Austria, until recently, mm. um, it's benign past was that they were a victim of Germany. Yeah, yeah. They all enthusiastically embraced it. It's now you're not there. In Italy and France, everybody yeah. took part in the resistance. resistance. I guess that, you know, I mean, all this is now uh, thanks to historians who come along <laughs> and, and people say, who lived through it and say, well, no, people who went through it do not. People who went through it keep quiet. They don't talk about it. Um, they're silent. And in fact, all of these revisions is 60s and even more in the 1970s, when a new generation came.
can arrive and say, actually, it's nothing to do with me. And what happened in Italy is that some were fascists, some were anti-fascist, in France, this, that, and the other. I mean, they you know, try, because they can be relaxed about it, because it does not involve them emotionally. Uh, just as, of course, as many of the survivors of, of Auschwitz uh, do not talk much about it, did not talk much about it, because the memory was such an awful thing to confront. Uh, and even they even felt guilty, I knew some of them, uh, for having survived. So it takes a good generation, and actually Germany has done quite, quite a bit. The countries which have done very little <coughs> are the countries whose narrative has been able to withstand um, any kind of historical thing, because they are so deeply embedded. And the consequences of this, we can see it today. Mm. The three countries are the United States, France, and Britain. When something bad happens in the world, immediately, in France, in the United States, and in Britain, people say, what should we do? Should we intervene? Should we bomb? Shouldn't we bomb? Should we send troops? Should we not send troops, and so on? When the, the Libyan event happened, when Gaddafi was ousted, uh, I was in Italy then. Now, if there is any part of Africa okay. where Italy should be a little bit self-conscious <laughs> about, or you know, it's got a little bit to do with them, that is Libya. No one in Italy, not a single politician, mm -hmm. asked itself, well, you know, should we intervene, should we help, should we not help, and so on. It was not, because Italy does not have fashion notwithstanding an imperial mentality. It has not got, uh, whenever it tried to get involved, it, uh, it lost, uh, either it didn't gain what it wanted from the war or, or it lost. Uh, the other countries are, it's Britain, France, and the United States. I can understand the United States because they spend half the world spending on, on military. So, well, you know, if you are the superpower, it's almost legitimate, you should ask yourself something or other. It's slightly less understandable when it comes to, you know, pretty much failed uh, uh, former imperial powers, mm. such as France and uh, Britain, and in which each has resolved uh, its connection with Europe in a completely di different way. Uh, the French have resolved it by imagining themselves to be the center of the European Union, and as long as the Germans were quite willing and ready to say, yeah, you are the boss, we and make we the pay. money, yeah. we make the money, we do the thing, you know, we do the work, but you know, you are the boss, and so on. And the De Gaulle Pact in 1963 with Adenauer was very much something like that. Britain did not make that kind, did not choose that kind of narrative. Ted Heath tried at one particular moment, and he could have, you know, he was the only pro -Europe, truly pro-European prime minister this, this country had, um, but obviously he failed mi miserably. And so since then, there is no role in Europe, which is why the isolation versus interventionism or the isolation versus involvement is a constant feature of British policy, as it is indeed of American policy. Yeah. Richard and then John. Uh, can I confess to a certain disquiet about this conversation uh, and uh, a professional disquiet about it, which is we've been talking about nations in Europe, and in fact Europe has been reconfigured as a Europe of cities, which puts the kind of national questions uh, in, I would say, a rather more faded light. For instance, the biggest trading partner financially of London is not Britain, it's Frankfurt. Uh, the major in, uh, influx of tourism in Europe is not travel to a country, but as we all know to our cost, uh, vast hordes of people traveling from Venice to London, to Rome, etc., on package tours. That's where the money for tourism comes. And this can be spread out in many positive as well as aversive ways. There are circuits of artistic transmission between European cities uh, where the art that's transmitted never gets into the countryside, nor do the people who see it. This wasn't true in 1914. There wasn't a Europe of cities. Mm -hmm. 
And I think one, I have to say, Maurice, I think one of the reasons that, I, I, I mean, I react emotionally, you know, uh, this is wonderful what you're saying. But in a way, we've moved on from that because we've, we, the nation state really, in economic and cultural terms, but not political, has uh, diminished greatly in its importance over the last century. And that, I don't think we've reckoned very much in all these discussions about yeah, yeah. Europe. Maurice, if you want to answer directly and then... Yeah, no, um, just to say, Richard, completely, I was given a sort of 12-minute um, overview to talk about our relationship with the EU. So, self-governing cities, how to reconstitute self-governing cities. I alluded to it slightly in London. So we've got this ancient tradition of democratic self-government in London, including, by the way, three accounts um, which, which are inherited, which have more than £200 million a year in interest alone. But we don't know the, the capital, we don't know the principal amount, because as an ancient city that's never been in debt, we don't know. So there's real space for reimagining the emergence of self-governing cities. Well, what I'm saying to you is quite the opposite, which is that it's not possible to have self-governing cities in Europe now. There has to be a different kind of political configuration because a material basis okay. is a network that has not existed before. And, and I'm saying that to conceptualize cities without citizens is, is problematic, but let's make that the occasion for another debate. Okay. Thank you. Well, just uh, th thanks for a re really, really, really stimulating um, uh, uh, exchange. But I just wanted to ask Really, to say, Don Maurice, I mean, I'm, I'm not completely persuaded by the ancient English constitution. And sometimes, when I was listening to you, I, there were, for me, there were echoes of, um, of William Cobbett, um, of, of late 18th century radicals, the Norman yoke. Christopher Hill wrote mm -hmm. a wonderful mm -hmm. article uh, uh, decades ago on this very question. It all seemed incredibly old-fashioned and actually not really in tune very much with, with what I, at least living in Ireland, viewing it from the outside, but sort of see as what's happened in Britain. I mean, to take, for example, the uh, uh, London, self-governing London. I mean, is this the self-governing London of the GLC that was abolished during the Thatcher years? Um, is Lon in what sense is, 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 does the city really represent something, something different other than a financial center, which of course exists elsewhere in Europe. As for the church, I mean, as far as I understand, there is still an established church in England. It may, very, it may be very nice that people now listen to Catholic, Catholic and think about Catholic social doctrine, but we're still living in a country which actually hasn't managed to disestablish the church and put other churches on an equal footing. Um, and in terms of the, um, the ancient English constitution, it seems to me that this was precisely their language. That first of all, it's a very European story, and there I agree completely with Donald. You know? I mean, the French always used to talk about um, the Frankish yoke, because, and I think it does go back before the 19th century, um, it was one of the ideas in the French Revolution that the French Revolution was the triumph of the ordinary French people, just like the Anglo-Saxons, against the feudal lords who were associated with the Franks who'd come in from outside. It's actually a very, very European story, and I would simply want to say that I think, and I was, I was just, and I'm interested in this because of, you know, your affiliation to the Labour Party and so on. For me, the Labour Party was all about the transformation of that ancient English constitution through Chartism, uh, through the Labour movement of the late 19th and early 20th centuries into something very, very different, which was creating a, a, an English stroke British version of a modern democracy and that's something which happened um, at roughly the same time along rather different paths in Europe. So I would simply uh, rejoin David in his concern here that I think that there is a place, I mean I can understand that currently there are both political and identity problems for England, the English in relation to the, uh, to the, to, to the rest of the United Kingdom, but it seems to me that there's a kind of danger in somehow focusing on, on Europe. As the as the as the as the counter figure against which one um, identifies all of that, um, some new kind of relationship um, or a continued relationship with Europe, it seems to me, is absolutely um, central. And I'm I, I, I'm just not persuaded, in fact, by the ancient English constitution. It doesn't describe what, what at least the way that I would see English politics as functioning. Okay. So um, many apologies first, because I'm going to have to go soon. But that's not. Um, just to say, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Um, 
The first response is it turned out that the labor movement was a much more complex phenomena than simply the delivery of progressive outcomes, that there were, that there were conception of, of liberties, there were ideas of democracy that, that, um, that we've tried to put back into the story. But the more important thing is not about Europe or anything, it's how to resist the domination of finance capital. And, and what are the traditions out of which that is done? And one of them is patriotism, another one is, 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 is church tradition, another one is localism. It's not as if there's a huge proliferation of them. How, how do people associate and assert their relational resistance to the domination of capital is the fundamental story. And the truth is, it goes back to, the truth is the 1914 story. Attlee and Bevin fought. Lansbury, there was a pacifist tradition and they <coughs> didn't. When Labour identified itself as a patriotic party um, that was simultaneously <coughs> competent and capable of resisting the domination of the rich within English history, that's when it resonated and won. So you can't divorce the political outcomes from the strategy through which people participate. So I could, you know, it, it, it's about opening up this conversation to how there can be a democratic resistance to um, not only finance capital, but abstract systems of governance that leave people isolated and powerless. And that's going to lead to many more of these conversations that are discomforting to a progressive assumption that assumed that this was going to happen by its, you know, this was going to happen easily. It's not. And so um, I just want to say it's been a very interesting conversation and thank you. 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 Good. Um, well, I'm staying for your comment. Yeah, okay. Um, because it's about resistance to yeah, yeah. finance capital or just to capitalism itself. One of the remarkable features about European politics, continental as well as British, is the absence of powerful pro-capitalist parties until about roughly 1980, 1960 if you like. Uh, traditionally, mass political parties were not pro-capitalist. They were socialist or they were church-based, like the German Christian Democratic Party and later the Italian Christian Democratic Party, the Austrian People's Party, and so on. Or you had agrarian parties which were against, like in Sweden, which were against uh, the capitalist e establishment. These parties, uh, before 1914, were on the whole in opposition. And they were in opposition against parties which did not claim to be pro-capitalist party, but they were political parties which claimed to be, by and large, uh, nationalist. Uh, they wanted the unity. So you have nationalism, church-based, and uh, social, uh, uh, so each with a different conception of what the national co community was against uh, the capitalist order. In the course, and I'm not going to give a lecture, so in the course of these years, for all sorts of reasons, by 1960 or 1980, all these forces had made their peace with capitalism, partly because once at the end of the 19th century, capitalism was a benefit maybe to 20% of the population. By 1960, 1980, it was a benefit to 80% of the population, the consumer society and all the rest of it. So it, since then, they all had to say, if you vote for me, among other things, one of the things I will do is to preserve the economic system as it is and defend it and enhance it and so on and so forth. You have them, you know, from free-handed free yeah, free free hand, yeah. too, but it's not just there, the German social democrats are the same, yeah. the Italian ex-communist, uh, the French socialist uh, privatize more staff than anybody else and, and, and so on and so forth. So this is the story now. There are no forces which can find in any tradition a resistance to capitalism. Now, um, since I'm a historian, I only look back and that's the story so far. Whether there will be and how and what form of regulation, I have absolutely no idea. But then neither has anybody else, since their failure to predict the collapse of communism, the rise of, of, uh, of uh, Muslim fundamentalism, you know, That's even wonderful. the collapse of uh, the, the lacks of communism. <laughs> so, yeah, it is one form. Yeah, yeah. But actually, it isn't really, because they don't have a discourse on the e economy. Um, there is hardly anyone with a discourse, with an original discourse on the economy. It's all between a lot of regulation or less. So, a lot of work to do. Yeah. yeah thank you.
from memory to... Off you go to the House of Lords and fight the right battle. From memory to capitalism. Thank you very much, Donald. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>